once the soldiers gather around him and his dark Gethsemane. See him stand before old Pilate, hear the crowd cry, crucified. What our blessed Savior suffered, see him bow his head and die. Watch him take his bleeding body, see him lay in the tomb. Watch him wrap him in the grave clothes, they had no more. And wait and worry, though they knew she had to die. While they waited for his promise, Christ was very much alive. Watch him say, see the shake the gates of hell. See him lose the chains of darkness. Must that power is dark to swell. See him rise up on that morning. Oh, that third appointed day. Watch him come in clouds of glory. See him take his turn. We are uh, just a little out of sorts. Uh, my family, uh, most of them have gone to uh, Bonifay, and it's my father-in-law's last day of being a pastor at uh, St. John's Church, and they're uh, having a new pastor uh, step in, and so um, Brenda said, I, want, I really want to go. I said, well, go. That's fine. Go. No problem. All the while I'm thinking, don't go. No. <laughs> I, I could not keep her from going, but uh, we certainly sure miss her when she's not here. But thank the Lord for you laboring for the Lord this morning. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. And I want to draw your attention to verse 32. And we'll read down through verse number 43. Luke chapter 23, and we'll begin reading at verse number 32, and we'll read down through chapter, uh, verse number 43. All right? Luke 23, verse 32. And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. 
And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But listen to this. But this man hath done nothing amiss. Let me say amen to that. Well, I wish I was like that, don't you? And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this Lord's day. And even though it's not the Easter Sunday, it still reminds us, Lord, of your resurrection. We're thrilled this morning that you live. You ever live. And soon we'll see you face to face. Lord, we need to hear from you. Lord, what I say is not really going to matter. But Lord, what you say is, has eternal weight. And I pray, God, that you might speak through me words of life. That you might help each and every individual that's in this worship service. Lord, we've all come with hungry hearts. and Lord, extended hands toward heaven. And God, we need you. And we pray, God, that you'd speak to us and that you would help us and Lord, you know our struggles and our sins and our shortcomings. And only you, God, can help us to live a life that's pleasing to the Father. And we pray, God, that you'd work in us this morning and help us to become more like Jesus. We ask, God, that you'd bless the service. If there's any here that are not saved, they've never met Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Would you please open up their heart, their mind to the truth? Holy Spirit, encourage them to come and receive Christ today. And we'll thank you for the work that you do, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. Next Sunday, the Lord willing, how many of you know that uh, we could be raptured before next Sunday, amen? amen? Or we could leave through the door of death, but the Lord willing, if we're still here, We'll celebrate the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He's alive. He lives. You say, preacher, how do you know that he lives? Well, I have a personal walk with him. And there are many in this building that have a personal relationship with the Lord. Amen? Amen? But as we think of the resurrection, Jesus coming back to life, and we have to take a step back, right? How did he get in that tomb? What caused his death? Why was he buried in a borrowed tomb? What happened that Jesus would have to come back to life again from the dead? And all the gospel writers record that our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified at Calvary. Now in your hymnal, we have a lot of songs about Calvary. Amen. At the cross, at the cross and. Many other songs, the old rugged cross, we talk about Calvary over and over again. It might interest you this morning that though the word Calvary in the Bible is only found in one place. That's in this verse that we read today. It's not recorded in Matthew, it's not recorded in Mark, it's not recorded in John. All the other writers refer to it as Golgotha or the place of a skull, place of a skull. But Luke says it is Calvary. And and by the way, uh, Sister Wilhelmina will look this up and testify. The word Calvary means a skull. So when we're singing about Calvary, we're really singing about the crucifixion and a skull shaped hill and where Christ died so that you and I can have a right relationship with God. Amen. Amen. And I'm so grateful that our Lord was willing to go to Calvary to save us from our sins. So we can't come to these passages lightly. Right? So often at Easter Easter time we think about the resurrection and we hear it every year. You know the danger that is? We kind of get hardened to it. A little bit callous. Right? And some would even say... 
Well, Brother Tommy, we've heard that over and over and over again. How many of you have been going to church most of your life? Well, you've probably heard a multitude of sermons on the resurrection, probably even more on the crucifixion of Christ, and we have a tendency, if we're not, if we're not careful, that when we read this uh, holy, amazing, miraculous event, that it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. God forbid that we get in a custom of hearing about Calvary and it not stir our innermost being, amen, to see what Jesus did so that you and I could have salvation and eternal life. We can't take it lightly. It is a solemn scene. It is a severe time of suffering, right? This was not a picnic for our Lord. This was the most cruel death that any individual could die. And Christ has already been beaten with a cat of nine tails. If you were to follow Jesus through the streets of Jerusalem outside the gate, up the hill, that skull-shaped hill, you would see a blood trail all the way until he finally lays down on that cross and is nailed there for your sins and my sins as a sacrifice to the Father. Amen? It's central to the salvation of all of us. Without this blood atonement, without this sacrifice, you and I would not have an opportunity to come into a right relationship with God. Think about that. There would be no forgiveness of sins. There would be no names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. There would be no access to God. There would be no renewed fellowship with God except through the shedding of the Lord Jesus Christ's blood on that old rugged cross. Amen? Amen. So don't ever look at this in a light manner or just... Read through it. In fact, what I do sometimes if I feel like I'm getting cold and indifferent when it comes to spiritual things, I will go to the book of Matthew chapter 27 and I will read the crucifixion because there's nothing that stirs the cords of love in my heart for Jesus. Nothing like looking at him loving me so much that he died for me on that cr cross. Amen. To see all that he went through. So that I can have forgiveness. Don't take that lightly. Amen. In fact to take it lightly. I would say to you. It's a mockery of Calvary itself. Wouldn't you? I mean we're looking at people in this text. The Sanhedrin or the rulers. Jesus is on that cross. Dying for their sins. And what is their response to that? The Bible says that they derided him. <laughs> they mocked him they ridiculed him you know they're still doing that even in our day you tell men that jesus loved them so much that they died he died for them on a cruel cross and they'll say some mocking blasphemous thing in response to this so you and i have to be extremely careful that we don't look at this holy solemn event with, with, uh, in any other way but reverence and godly fear Amen? Don't make a mockery of what Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary by thinking of it lightly. When Paul was trying to encourage the Galatian believers, he said, let me remind you that Christ was crucified before your eyes. Now, they didn't see the crucifixion, but Paul preached about that cross and they believed it and they saw it by the eyes of faith. And it stirred their heart to put their love and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen. Amen. May the Lord do the same thing in your heart this morning and in my heart. The word derided means to ridicule or to express contempt for. Is it kind of heartbreaking to you when you see Jesus there suffering? I mean, the innocent, sinless Son of God suffering for these individuals around that cross, and they're just jeering at him, mocking him, and ridiculing him. It troubles me, and it ought to trouble all of us. Amen? But it wasn't just the Sanhedrin that mocked and ridiculed and derided Jesus, the Gentile soldiers, the Roman soldiers chimed in. 
Look at what the Roman soldier said. They mocked him also, coming to him with offering him vinegar or soured grape juice, undrinkable. And then notice they said this, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. So you and I, when we come to this event in the Bible, should approach it with our shoes off. We are on holy ground, most holy ground. This event is an historical event. It changes history itself. Amen? We're in, we're, can y'all believe we're in 2024? I almost said 2022. <laughs> we're, we're way past that. But you need to ask yourself the next question. 2024 from what? Or from who? Amen? When Christ came in the world, history is his story. Amen? He is the focal, focal point of all of history itself. And he came for this reason, Brother Daniel, to take your sins and my sins and pay the debt that we, that we owed. Amen? Amen? So the soldiers ridiculed him. It wasn't just the soldiers, but many others. So we cannot do that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15, Paul tells us our proper response to Calvary. This is, this is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. And then he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Then how are we supposed to live? If I can't live for myself, Brother Brian, if I can't just do what I want to, if I can't live to do the things that I enjoy, then how am I supposed to live, Brother Corey? but unto him which died for them. You know, what we, when we look at Calvary, you know what it demands out of us? If Jesus gave all of this to save you, then the only right response to this is for us to lay our lives in the altar and say, Lord, here is my life. You do with it whatever you want to. Amen? Amen. Is that true or not? Remember what Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 say? Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, I plead with you. Please listen to what I'm saying. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Lay that life of yours down in this altar, holy and acceptable unto God. Listen to what he said now. Which is your reasonable service? Isn't that true? Since he done all of this for me, what's the only response? It's not mockery. It's not ridicule. It's not ignoring it. It's bringing my life before him and laying my life at his feet and saying, Jesus, you do with my life whatever you want to do with it. Amen? That's the right response. And Paul certainly got a hold of that, didn't he? Remember before Paul met Jesus, what kind of man was he? <laughs> he hated Christ. He did everything he could to wipe Christianity off the face of the earth. Right? I mean, that was his number one goal, to put this cult out of business. He would go from town to town, Brother Henry, just to find a group of Christians to stop their worship, to put them in prison, and he even had some killed. But when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, what happened? He said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Have you ever asked Jesus that question? You know, you're not in this world to live for yourself. You're not in this world to do your own thing. You are here to do the will of your creator. If you're here this morning and you have no personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, the very first thing you must do is recognize that Christ paid for your sins on that cruel cross and embrace that truth, accept Christ as your Savior. But it doesn't end there, does it, Sister Jones? Now it is, Lord, here's my life. What do you want to do with it? You know what the major problem in Christianity is today? We've got a lot of people who want to go to heaven when they die. 
After all, who wants to go to the other place? Right? Who wants to go to hell? Well, we don't want to go there, so let's, let's have this Jesus. But it seems like we're only interested in getting a ticket to heaven, and we're not really interested in what the Bible wants from all of us is to bring our lives to Jesus and let Jesus do with us whatever he wants to do with us. Amen? Calvary, where Jesus would shed his blood, pour out his life so that you and I could have forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. Let me point out a few things about this section of Scripture. First of all, I want you to notice his association. Look back in verse number 32. There are some interesting words there. There were also two other malefactors. Brother Brian, if you're looking at that, I mean, he's being included in those with those two, isn't he? Two other? Didn't just say, and they were two malefactors. It says there, there's Jesus, this criminal Jesus, and then these other two criminals. That's what the word malefactor means. These people were thieves. They were insurrectionists. There, there's no telling exactly what all crimes that they committed, and we heard their testimony, didn't we? They said, we are on this cross because we deserve it. You know what they said? We're guilty. We have committed crimes. This is the right punishment for us. But one of them said, this is the wrong punishment for him. Amen? He's never done anything wrong. We have been wrong, but he hasn't done anything wrong. Talking about his association. The Bible, though, puts Jesus right there with him. Isn't that right? Yes. By the way, that shouldn't be shocking to us. When Jesus walked on this earth, you know, one of the accusations, one of the criticisms of Jesus, one of the ways that they said, you can't be the Messiah, there's no way that you can be the Messiah. One of the main criticisms was, he is a friend of publicans and they say Jesus if you were the holy son of God you wouldn't be hanging around sinners right I mean, you're, after all you're supposed to be pure you're supposed to be holy and when we see you we see you with sinners by the way when they made that comparison they were comparing Jesus to John and said, so, but you know, John, he had the camel's hair and he ate locusts and wild honey. I mean, his, he was kind of, you know, really disciplined. And, and here you are, Jesus. You're just eating with publicans and sinners and you're, you're drinking. And in fact, they said, you're, you're eating so normally, you look like a glutton. And you're drinking, you look like a wine bibber, somebody who's always drinking wine. By the way, that was criticism, that wasn't true. They're just trying to find some fault in Jesus. And by the way, the world is still trying to find fault in him, amen? Yeah. And praise the Lord for this, they still hadn't found any. <laughs> but they said that, uh, they, they made that comparison in Matthew chapter 11. You know, the, it was bad enough, Brother Bruce, to say he was a glutton. It's, it's blasphemous to say he was a wine bibber. But you know what they did? They went a little further. In their minds, they went a little further. He actually eats with sinners. Remember that time he's invited into the Pharisee's house and he's sitting there. This woman comes into that house. How many of y'all remember this story? She sees the dirty feet of Jesus. His feet were supposed to be clean when he came to the house. <coughs> How could anybody treat Jesus this way, she said. And it broke her heart. Remember what she did? Her tears started gushing out. Those tears were the washing water that would wash his feet. And she didn't have a towel, so she took her hair and she dried his feet. And you know what the Pharisees saying the whole time? If he knew what kind of man, uh, he, uh, what kind of woman that she is, he would not let her touch him. 
Wasn't that the accusation? How many of y'all remember that? If you knew how an awful sinner she is, you wouldn't let her touch your feet. You wouldn't let her wash your feet. You wouldn't let her dry it with the hair of your head. I say, Preacher, why are you mentioning that? Because I want you to know something. If you're in a lost state, listen, Jesus is the best friend that you can ever have. You know why some people don't come to Jesus? Because they're deceived by the devil into believing that Jesus doesn't want them. You know what the devil is? He is a dirty, rotten, filthy liar. You know Jesus came to seek and to save sinners? That's why he's here. He wants you. He invites you to come. He died on that cross so that you could come. No one has ever loved you as much as Jesus loves you. Amen? But you know there's a greater fulfillment of this passage. It's found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Isaiah wrote 700 years before Christ. Some of you have asked this question before. Brother Tommy, how do you know the Bible is true? I mean, there, there's the Koran, there's the writings of the Hindus, there's all, there's all kind of religious books out there. How, how can you know without a doubt that the Bible is true? You can know it this way. None of those other books have any prophecy in it whatsoever. This book does. And you know why God told you about events that would happen 700 years before it? or a thousand years before it, so that you could read it yourself, and you could see that God told exactly what would happen, and so that you would trust His Word and believe His Word. 700 years before this event, Isaiah the prophet wrote in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 12 that he would be numbered with the transgressors. How many ways could it be that, uh, I know one way biblically, but how many ways would you think there could be that Christ might have died? Endless, right? Remember they tried to stone him on one occasion. Another occasion they tried to throw him off a cliff. Swords and arrows and spears. They're going to tell me how many ways he could have died, right? But Isaiah didn't say, oh, he died some death like this. No, he said he would be counted with the criminals. He would be numbered with the criminals. They would treat, they would kill him like they killed criminals. I want you to turn there if you have your Bibles with you. Isaiah 53 is an amazing chapter. That's the chapter that tells us that Jesus took our sins upon himself while you're turning there, I read verses 5 and 6 of Isaiah 53 for you. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Amen? He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. You say, preacher, what is my problem? What is my problem in my relationship with God? is that you are living for yourself. You've turned away. You're doing your own thing. We, we've all done that. Amen? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every man to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Look at the last verse of that chapter 53. Verse 11 says, he'll see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied that Christ's death on the cross brings atonement. It appeases God's wrath. Therefore, will I divide a portion with the great? He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. Listen, and he bare the sins of many and made intercession for transgression. Isn't that amazing? 700 years before Christ would go to the cross and be hung between two thieves, numbered up on that hill, one, two, three criminals, there they are. Isaiah 
Isaiah said, when he dies, he'll die like a criminal. Why did God record that? He recorded that so that you could see the word of God is true and that you would put your faith in this Jesus and have salvation and eternal life. Amen? You see his association? Look secondly this morning then at his, at his atonement. Look at that next verse. Verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, notice these words, there they crucified him. What is all that about? I see Christians wearing crosses. We have crosses on the outside of our building, cross here in the baptistry. What is that cross all about? That cross is about bringing you and I back into a oneness with God. That's what it's all about. Calvary, this bloody crucifixion, all that Jesus went through, what's the purpose of it? To bring a sinner back into a right relationship with a sovereign God. You know how many people are trying to get right with God? But they're try listen to me, they're trying to get right with God the wrong way. Paul wrote about this in the book of Romans, didn't he? He said, listen, I've got to give it to my kinsmen, Israel. They have a zeal. They, they want to do what's right in God's sight. They have an earnest desire. But he said they've erred. They, they've gotten off track. They're going in the wrong direction. How are they going in the wrong direction, Brother Wesley? Because they're trying to obtain righteousness through their own good works. Don't y'all see the major problem with that? I use this in witnessing. It might help you if you're trying to talk to someone who doesn't know Christ. Because we'll meet a lot of people who think that they're good enough to go to heaven or they're trying to be good enough to go. Amen? And this is what I like to share with them. If you could be good enough to go to heaven, Jesus would never have died. Isn't that true? If there was another way if, if uh, the Koran was right, Jesus would not have had to die. Amen? If the Hindu writers are right, what's the purpose of the cross? It would, be, it would be of no value at all if there was some other way to get right with God. But friends, there is no other way. You remember our Lord praying in the Garden of Gethsemane? And it was an intense praying. It was so intense that sweat drops were coming off his body as drops of blood. I, I uh, sweat a lot when I'm outside working. <laughs> My dad always did. He used to take an extra shirt or something. And he'd wring it out and it's just it's like you poured a water hose on. But I have never sweated to that point, Brother Brian, where it was as great uh, uh, drops of blood. You talk about agony. You talk about intensity. You talk about burden. He's there in the garden praying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I said, Preacher, why would he pray that prayer? Because he's about to take your sin and my sin upon himself. The sinless son of God. I think that's the worst thing. That he was. I have to take this sin. I've got to become guilty. I have to be as though I've sinned. And so in agony. He's saying father. Is there another way? Is there something else that we can do? Is there, is, is there another way to atone for their sins? And he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And what did Jesus do when he rose up from that prayer time? Where did he go? He went from one court to another court until he finally laid his life down on that cross. Don't you think when Jesus prayed, the Father heard his prayer? Oh, yes. <laughs> Don't you know that the Father loved the Son? So, if there was any, any, 
any, any other way, that would have never happened. How many of y'all see it? Do you see that? Yes. You've got to see that. That's the only way that you and I can have a right relationship with God. And to try to have it and ignore Jesus is blasphemous. It is a great evil to think that somehow you could bypass Jesus and have your own right relationship with God. I remember witnessing to a neighbor of mine who had cancer. And before he found out that he had cancer, I, I, I talked to him he said, Hey, I've got my own line to heaven. Me, me and the man upstairs, we got, we got our own thing going on. I got my own way. Got my own. I, I, I'm all right. You know what happened when he got cancer? An uncle of his that was a saved man came with a sense of time with him, and that man who had his own way found the right way. He said, this my way is not going to cut it now. I need Jesus. Amen. And I'll, I want you to remember this. On that cross, when he's shedding his blood, he's shedding his blood so that your sin debt could be erased. It could be paid for. So that when you stand before God, God doesn't see the multitude of your sins. What does he see? He sees, he sees the blood of his son. And he sees that all those sins have been forgiven. We don't understand how holy God is. We really don't have a clue. I think even as Christians, sometimes we have a really terrible mindset. We have this mindset, well, you can you know, sin. Sin's not all that bad. After all, you can always get forgiveness for it, right? So we treat it like it's not a big deal. You know what God says about sin? He said, I will not acquit any sin. I'm not going to overlook any sin. All sin must be punished. It all must be dealt with. Me and Brother Phil was out the other day door knocking and we met this Muslim man. And in the Muslim faith, if you ask God for forgiveness, he forgives you. Now you know what? You know, a part of the problem there is it's kind of a half truth that Right? Because God does forgive sin, right? But he forgives sin on a certain basis. So I told that young Muslim man, I said, listen, what if you committed murder, or someone murdered someone in your family, you're in the court, that guy's really guilty, everybody knows he's guilty, and before the judge says, I'm going to sentence you to death or life in prison, the, the guilty man says, wait a minute, you're on, hold on, stop one second, will you just forgive me? And, I, and if the judge said, sure, you're free to go. How would you feel about that? Ooh. You know what? God's justice and righteousness is much, much greater than that. Do you know all sin has, has to be punished? This is the good news. That's what Calvary's about. Amen? Amen? Amen. That everything that I've ever done that's sinful in the sight of God, Christ took all that sin upon himself, and he paid for every single sin. And by the way, that's the only way to get payment for sin. That's right. The atonement. What does the word atonement mean? It means reparation for wrong or injury. It's an agreement or reconciliation after enmity or a controversy. See, we here's the holy God who made us, and guess what we've done? We've, we've spurned that. We've turned from that. We've rebelled against Him. And God said, hey, we have a conflict. What's that conflict? You keep doing what you want to do, and you're not going to do what I want. You keep sinning. And Jesus took the hand of the Father, and He took our hand, the sinner, and He brought us together. You break that little word down, atonement means at one mint. Amen? He makes us one with the Father again. How can I have a right relationship with God? Through what Jesus did at Calvary. Can I say something to you this morning? There is no other way. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen? In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it says this about the blood that was shed. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. Listen, for it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. Did he say in Leviticus, it's your good works that make atonement. It's you trying hard that makes atonement. No, he said, the only thing, Brother Brian, that makes atonement is the blood. Amen? And that's what bloody Calvary is all about. That God is reconciling us to himself. So Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says this, In whom we have redemption, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. You want your sin forgiven this morning? You must put that sin under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins. And listen, he closes that verse by saying this, according to the riches of his grace. Say, preacher, I don't deserve it. Well, none of us did. Amen. Revelation 1 verse 5 says this. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the king of the earth, unto him that loved us, are you listening? He loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's what Calvary's all about. God loving you. You all know that verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. What did he do because he loved the world? He gave his only begotten son. That what? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, go to hell, but have what? Everlasting life. If you're not saved, do you want to be saved? Do you want to go to heaven when you die? Do you want your sins forgiven? There's only one way. And that's through what Christ did on the cross. And you're trusting that. You say, preacher, I'm working on it. Don't work on it. Don't work on it. Come and put your faith in Jesus. Amen. Come and trust Jesus. Come and believe that what He did for you is sufficient. Amen? Amen? That's sufficient. And receive Him this morning. Amen? How many of you today know without a doubt that you've received Christ as your personal Savior? You know for, without a doubt, I've trusted Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. I remember that I was saved. I come to an altar and I said, Lord, I believe that. I accept that. And he changed my life. That very night, he changed my life. And if you've not trusted him, he'll change yours as well. Amen? But if you're a Christian and you're not as close to him as what you ought to be, can I, can I plead with you this morning, beseech you, will you please come to this altar and say, Lord, I've been trying to live my life doing my own thing. You gave everything so that I could be saved. And what I want to do this morning is lay my life down before your feet and say, Lord, you do with me whatever you want. Some of you have been saved for quite, a, quite, a, quite some time, right? And maybe there has been a time past that you said, that's me. I've given Jesus everything. But you realize this morning because of the cross and Calvary that it's not that way right now. There are other things there. And I plead with you, come again. And say, Lord, here's my life. Do with it whatever you want. Would you do that this morning? Let's stand for a word of prayer. Sister Sharon, will you come and help us please? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you.